Good morning. The secret of success is the ability to concentrate one-pointedly on whatever task you set yourself. Good morning. Good morning, Jamalji. Welcome to Ananda Gurgaon's satsang today. Uh, most people in Ananda Gurgaon know Ramchari Jamal, but still, we would like to give you an uh, introduction for him. Uh, Ramchari Jamal met uh, Swami Kriyananda in 2003 and has been with him till Swami's passing in 2013. He has been living in uh, India since 2005, mostly helping the monks, Ananda monks in India. And uh, he has given several lectures, taken workshops and classes all over the world. Uh, right now, he lives in Khandala in the monastery, Ananda monastery, helping the young monks. And he also leads the Ananda uh, home study uh, course, which is uh, a correspondence course for people who don't have centers in their regions. He helps them get prepared for receiving a Kriya Yoga. So we welcome you once again. Thank you for uh, being with us. It's over to you now. Thank you, Jayanti. That um, was such a beautiful uh, introduction message by Swamiji um, with those the Good Morning series that he made for all of us. In fact, I have those uh, on my phone and I use them as an alarm to wake up with. But this one this morning was very beautifully chosen for this topic, relaxed concentration, the secret to success in everything. And Swamiji really, he lived this. He taught us these things, but he taught more than anything by example. Anyway, I'm very excited to speak on this topic. It's a wonderful topic. But before we do that, we'll play a chant and we'll meditate for about 10 minutes. Uh, the first line to this chant is, Think ye, or think you, uh, in your heart um, of the lotus feet of your guru. And this, again, is the essence of this topic, is how do we think in our heart, not our mind, but how do we think in our heart of, our lo of the lotus feet of our guru? How do we concentrate on that? So anyway, uh, we'll play this chant for a few minutes, and then we'll meditate for a few minutes, then we'll have the satsang. <clears throat> So let me turn on the right button, and here we go. Think ye in my heart, lotus feet of the high Think ye in my heart, lotus feet. I do. If you want to cross the ocean of delusion, if you want to cross the ocean of delusion, shaming the white lotus of purity, shaming the white lotus of purity, beyond all duality, guru image of Brahma, deliver us from delusion. Guru image of Brahma, deliver us from delusion. Think ye in my heart, lotus feet of the high guru. Think ye in my heart, lotus feet of the high guru. If you want to cross the ocean of delusion, if you want to Shaming the white lotus and purity, shaming the white lotus and purity, beyond all duality, Guru image of Brahma, deliver us from delusion. Guru image of Brahma, deliver us from delusion. Think ye in my heart, lotus feet of the high Think ye in thy heart, lotus feet of thy guru. If you want to cross the ocean of delusion, if you want to cross the ocean of delusion, 
Shaming the white lotus of purity, shaming the white lotus of purity, beyond all vanity, when it does grow hard, glorious from delusion. Guru, image of Brahma, glorious from delusion. Thinking in my heart, don't just feed on the heart. On all duality, Guru image of Brahma, deliver us from delusion. 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 Guru image of Brahma. Let us pray together, Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna. Lady Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, our beloved Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, and saints of all religions, we humbly bow to you all. Great Masters, guide us this morning, guide our meditation, guide our lives, help us to develop perfect concentration and perfect devotion so that we may live in your grace eternally. Om. Shanti, shanti, shanti. Let us meditate now for seven or eight minutes. Please practice any techniques that you know.
Please take a moment to inwardly, silently send blessings, God's blessings through you, either to the world or to any person who knows in need of you. Well, again, a very warm welcome to everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you this morning. And this topic is actually so very important um, because once we really grasp this, we realize that we can be successful in absolutely anything. And it's the key to success, as the title says, for everything. Because we would think that if I want to be a successful engineer, I need to learn X, Y, Z. If I want to be a successful musician, I need to learn A, B, C. Um, and it's true that we do need to learn these particular details for whatever field we wish to have success in. But beyond all of that, there's an underlying principle for success, which is concentration. And the way that that really works is for us to understand magnetism. And of course, to understand magnetism, we have to understand energy. And this is what yoga is all about. And let me make an important point right now of what yoga is all about. And if we want to have concentration, we will need two things. We will need to have a greater flow of energy and specifically a greater flow of energy flow into the brain. Um, and then the second thing is that energy, it can either be focused or it can be diffuse, going everywhere. And so if that energy is focused, we will have greater concentration. And so these two things, again, are a greater flow of energy and making sure that energy is focused. You know, sometimes there's people in the world, I've never said this outwardly, but inwardly I would just say, Oh, there he goes, run around Rajo, that's someone who's very rajasic and might put out a lot of energy, but it's not focused. And so he will have mild success in this world, but it will still fluctuate up and down and it won't really go anywhere long term. Now, of course, it's better to have some energy, even in that way, than to have no energy. Is that a uh, strong flow of energy, focused energy, it creates a magnetism. And we can learn how to create a success magnetism where we know that we will succeed no matter what goes on in outer circumstances. And of course, it takes a strong will to set our mind to succeed at any given task and make it happen. And we learn this through actually repeated failures. So if you fail a million times at something, don't worry, that it's just the opportunity uh, to learn, to grow. I want to say a personal story. And uh, long ago when I, I don't know, it was long ago, uh, 2009 it probably was, I decided that I wanted to raise $200,000 for Ananda, that I wanted to basically cover the Watunde land that we have there with solar panels. Uh, that Swamiji was speaking in hard times. And I felt that if we had our own electricity, that then we could make it through whatever hard times there were. And I was very young and naive, actually, about all of these different things. I'd never tried to raise $5 before. And I had no idea how hard it would be to raise $200,000. Um, and I chose that number thinking, well, even if we, you know, raise $100,000, uh, what does it matter? That at least we'll have that many solar panels. It will be good. And uh, all kinds of things started I mean, once I started churning the ether with that uh, desire uh, to raise that amount of money. Let me back up just for one second. Master's definition of willpower is energy plus desire directed towards fulfillment. You should memorize that. Willpower is energy plus desire directed towards fulfillment. And you should not only memorize it, think about it, uh, meditate on it, understand those words. It goes into the chant that I played this morning um, because that word desire is in there. And so I had this desire to raise this particular amount of money. 
Now, I made number one mistake, thinking that, well, if we only get a certain amount of number, at least I aimed high and it's good enough. That's not good enough for a yogi. It's whatever you set your will to, that you need to put all of your energy, even if it kills you, into that, into achieving that goal. So I should have had more discrimination and more understanding to realize uh, what it was that I was trying to accomplish, that I would set my will to and keep going and keep going no matter what, to make as many phone calls as were needed. Um, anyway, our organization was very young at that point, and it turned out we weren't able to handle this amount of flow of energy that I was trying to push through it. And, things were getting a little hot here and there. And so I decided to back off on the project. Um, anyway, around $50,000 was set to come in and all these different ways. I don't want to go into the details, but I learned a lot. But the whole reason I thought of that is whole story. Ian Swamiji said, when you set your will to something, don't give up no matter what. And it was after I had given up on this project and I realized that I would never do that again, to set higher than and just let halfway sloppy be okay. That in whatever I was going to do, that I was going to, first of all, think carefully about it. Do I have that amount of magnetism? Do I have that amount of support from other people? Do I have that amount of commitment, that amount of energy? Is this a realistic goal? And then once setting it, not let anything let me waver from that. And so I think that's an important lesson for us all, no matter what we're doing, whether we're raising money or whether we're even doing something simple like rearranging our kitchen so that energy in there can flow more smoothly. And this is another important point that I wanted to bring up this morning, that um, if let's say you decide that you're going to rearrange your kitchen so that it can be more clean, so so you can know where the places are, so that energy flows in there from the cooking to the dishes, from how the dishes are dried, to are the dish towels clean. You can get really deep into these things and it's a wonderful thing to do. Don't think that it's more important to raise $200,000 than it is to have your kitchen orderly. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It, what matters is the amount of concentration and energy you put in. But the point we're getting to here is, if you really get into reorganizing your kitchen and then you sit down and you decide in the evening, now I'm going to sit to meditate, you'll find if you've really been putting a strong flow of energy into that kitchen organizing, you've been writing down all kinds of ideas, deciding how much it might cost to buy new accessories or new cabinets or whatever, now you sit to meditate and instead of Hong Sa, your mind keeps going back to kitchen rearranging. And now I've found this again and again in my life, that when I have a really serious project, I'm really putting all that I have into it, then when I sit down to meditate, it's difficult for me to just turn that off. And actually this is uh, how this topic came into being, was that in the last few weeks, I've just really made a really intense effort to take my mind and say, okay, this is a good project that I'm doing, but now is not the time to think about it. Now is the time for Hong Sa. And that I feel within myself that I can accomplish absolutely anything that I wish to do in this world. And that I have plenty of time to do it. And that there's enough time, there's enough energy, there's enough mental power, clarity, focus, there's enough friends that I can ask for help if I don't know how to do something. It can all be done. But the question is, when? And when we sit to meditate, that is not the time to be thinking about different projects. And you'll find that this happens even more and more deeply the more you really are intensely committed to some project and using your will because you're focused in that particular way and you're good. But then it becomes hard to switch over to the other side and focus on Hong Sa, for example. But we must learn how to do this. Now, a common mistake that many beginning yogis make and in, this is even in the Gita, is, well, I'm putting so much energy into action that now I can't meditate. So I think I'll just put less energy into action. And these projects, are oh, it's all a dream anyways. You'll never make it to God realization with that attitude, with that wrong understanding. We have to act in this world. 
and we have to act in a concentrated manner in this world. All of these projects that we do are for us to realize, for us to gain that inner strength, that realization that we can accomplish absolutely anything in this world. And I want you right now in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, feel that. These are not just idle words that I'm just saying. I don't do these satsangs just for my health or something. I do this because I know that this is truth, that I watched Swami Kriyananda live this, and that I know that you too can awaken these hidden potentials within yourself. But you have to believe them. You have to wake up to it. You have to want it. You have to believe that within yourself, God is sleeping in there and God wants to wake up. And God wants to be able to accomplish absolutely everything through you. But you have to let him do it. But anyway, I want to shake you a little bit and wake you up a little bit. But the point here is don't think, okay, now this uh, activity is messing up my meditation. I'm not going to do it anymore. You'll never get there. You have to learn how to switch your mind, switch your energy, switch your energy to outward flowing, to helping this world, to serving, then switch your energy, bring it back in, practice how you stop. That was another thing that I wanted to speak about this morning, and I will, but, and I want you to focus on what I'm saying, so take this thought, but then let it go for a moment. It is, I'm going, I want you all to ask questions at the end of this, say at about 9.45, I'll explain how you can write them down in the chat right now. But don't even worry about that right now. Focus, concentrate on what I'm saying. So back to Hong Sa is, this is the technique of concentration. And that if we practice this with concentration, that it will help our outer activity because we will learn how to concentrate outwardly. We'll learn how to concentrate inwardly. If you've been on the path for a long time, don't think, oh, Hong Sa, it was just for the beginners. That's level one, lessons in meditation. I'm a big, bad Kriyaban now. I don't need Hong Sa. We all need Hong Sa. We need Hong Sa more than ever these days. We need Hong Sa all the way up until the very end, until we can learn how to go into Samadhi with only Hong Sa, without even Kriya, that it's possible to learn how to, just by watching the breath and concentrating on it and using the mantra, and the understanding of how Hong Sa is supposed to work, it's possible to bring your breath down to zero and go off into that space, into infinity, into eternity. Master said, if you want to be a master in this lifetime, practice Hong Sa for two hours every day. It's a big thing. Many of us might say, but I don't have that kind of time. I have a family, I have a job, I have social commitments. All right. But you at least can take one day off per week and practice Hong Sa for two hours. And if you can't do it for two hours at a stretch, well, do one hour in the morning, do one hour in the evening. And don't forget your Kriyas, that if you are a Kriya Bhan, your Kriya is going to help you take you deeper into understanding Hong Sa and to being able to practice Hong Sa more deeply. And it's going to help you learn to feel this energy in your spine. Um, the next point that I wanted to make this morning was Swamiji wrote a class called Akash, which was ancient keys for achieving success and happiness. And one of those keys that he gave was concentration. And he said, try to hold in your mind for even five minutes, something like a flower. Just try to hold that in your mind. And I've never heard him say this. I mean, it's not when we learn Hong Sa or Kriya or anything like that. So I've experimented with this. And it's a wonderful thing to see and to try to do. And if we face it and we think that once you try it, you'll realize it's not easy to just put your mind on a flower for five minutes. That all of these thoughts from the past, future ideas that we have, they're going to intrude themselves in. But it's fine. When we bring our mind back and we learn to concentrate, that that is the success. And let's face it, it takes a long time for us to learn how to concentrate in this way, but it's worth it. It's worth it because then we can become successful at absolutely anything that we want to do. And this title says learn how to be, or basically learn how to become a success at everything. That if we learn how to become successful at even one thing, then we'll learn that inner principle and we'll learn how to apply that to be successful at everything. 
and our entire life will become a success. With Swamiji at the end of his life, he was making movies, he was doing all of these different things. He had so many different successful communities going on and he was doing this uh, with ease, with grace. And so the next point is relaxation. The concentration, if it's this grim determination, it crashes. And whatever amount of energy we're able to channel, we'll be able to do that for a while and we will get some success, but then it will crash down again. But to be able to sit perfectly still for two hours, to be able to concentrate, to meditate for long, long periods of time, eight hours, 10 hours, it can't only be with that aggressive type of willpower. We have to sink into it. We have to calmly relax. If once Master told Swamiji, Swamiji asked Master, I'm having difficulty in meditation. Master said, it's because you're trying too hard. Master said, when you go to sleep at night, you try to go to sleep? No. You simply sit back, and relax, and fall asleep. And it's the same way that we have to relax into meditation. We have to relax into concentration. And again, coming back to Hong Sa, that this is where it's such a beautiful thing that if we relax too much in Hong Sa, we'll find that the subconscious mind again has intruded and we're thinking about all these different things and we're not even really aware that we're thinking. You know, one of the secrets of meditation in Hong Sa is that you are going to penetrate through the subconscious mind into the superconscious mind, but you're going to stay conscious throughout that entire journey. And so the subconscious mind is there. It is our friend in the end. It's a repository for all of our knowledge that we've gained over all of our incarnations, actually. And so, but we need to put that subconscious mind in our control and learn how to even calm that down. And actually, it's almost like the subconscious mind and the conscious mind become united, but you're conscious and you flow then into superconsciousness. Memorize the poems of Samadhi. There's a line in there, and it says, Samadhi but extends my conscious realm to farthest boundary of eternity. And meditate on, take just like two lines like that. that Samadhi but extends my conscious realm beyond all limits of the mortal frame was a line that I forgot. Uh, to farthest boundary of eternity. But so beyond all the limits of our conscious mind, and this physical body and this conscious physical world. We use our conscious mind to understand what's going on in this physical world. But we can take our conscious mind in meditation using Hong Sa and go beyond into the astral world and beyond that into the causal world, into super consciousness. So if you practice Hong Sa with too much relaxation, it becomes hazy. Subconscious mind comes in. Tendency to fall asleep comes in. If you practice Hong Sa with too much determination and willpower, you'll find, and, and using your will too much to concentrate, you will find that you're controlling the breath and that you're not just watching it and letting it flow. Um, I don't know, many great masters have given this analogy of the ocean and the sky, and there's a line that divides the ocean and the sky. And that line is super consciousness. That line, it both divides and it unites. But that same line you can find at your eyeballs <laughs> with a dark field on top and a light field on bottom. That light field is the conscious mind in this conscious world. That dark field on top is the subconscious mind. And we're learning to calm the waves of feeling and uh, calm the waves of thought so that we're not going back and forth between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And these become one. And they're both united and divided by that thin line of superconsciousness. Another way of looking at it is that this light is going to develop through the dark field there, through the uh, uh, subconscious mind, and it's going to allow us to penetrate into the superconscious mind. I've probably gone way off into deep philosophy, but you take any, any one little point there, even just trying to keep your eyelids still, that's concentration, and you can go into superconsciousness through an understanding and a deep practice of that. Uh, the next point that I wanted to make was that concentration does not only mean in this one minute or these two minutes. It also means 
Can you stay concentrated over many, many months? Can you stay concentrated for an entire incarnation? I was speaking of Swamiji making movies at the end of his life and uh, running all of these different communities with just ease and grace. But Swamiji, from the time he was very young, from the time he met Master, he knew his life mission was to make these communities. what his mission was and he just for year after year after year he drove in that direction well it says my internet connection is unstable let's pray that it becomes stable again if i were to disappear i promise i'll come right back i have uh, backup plans to keep going and to finish this satsang um but anyway whatever your mission is in life don't give up just keep going, keep going. All of this outward stuff is just for us to learn how to develop our willpower. In the end, it doesn't matter all of these outward things. It only matters into the fact that we can learn to develop our willpower. We can learn to develop sensitivity, compassion for others, and understanding. But the end result, God doesn't care if you make 500 crore in this incarnation or if you only make 10 rupees. It, it doesn't matter. Um, what matters is our love for him. One more point I wanted to make on Swamiji in these communities. This is just an interesting conversation I had with Naya Swami Asha. This yellow that I'm wearing, part of the, um, the order, the Naya Swami order that Swamiji founded. And when Swamiji made that, he suggested that we put hoods on this uh, outfit so that we could uh, whenever the outer world was too kind of rajasic or crazy or we just felt to withdraw, that we could do that. You know what? I was at some train station with Jayaji, and he had a hood. And I saw him just put it over and he started meditating. And I thought, Swamiji had something with this hood thing. Now, we're not wearing hoods at the moment. And uh, Basically, a lot of people just felt, Swamiji, please don't make me wear this hood. It's going to look crazy. It's going to look weird. I already have to wear this bright blue or bright yellow or whatever it is. Please, no hoods. So Swamiji felt that public opinion was not ready for hoods. So he just backed up on it. But the interesting conversation that I had with Naya Swami Asha was, she said that had he still been in his body, that I, I lived with him for so many years. I know Swamiji. He would have just backed up, maybe even for 10 years, 15 years. But then when the timing was right, he would push it again. And just that little conversation about hoods made me think so much. Number one, I don't think that Swami ever did any one little thing out of personal desire. That he did it out of, what does God want him? What's even right with hoods or no hoods? And I found that when I attuned myself to his will, all right, maybe I don't want to wear a hood. That's a personal desire. But if Swami says wear a hood, I'll hood. And of course, I have to balance all of these different things with what's going on. But sometimes it's not right. Sometimes what becomes more important is your inner attunement to Swami. Rather than me now saying, I'm going to change all of Ananda and Swami said hoods, and I don't care if nobody else wears a hood. Sometimes it's just better to, he backed up on it, okay, I'll back up on it too. But the important thing is this inner attunement with him. And so these last few minutes, I want to speak about these waves of feeling, chitta. That in the beginning here I said, um, Master's definition for will was desire plus energy directed towards fulfillment. This word desire of the heart, I played the chant. Um, think ye in thy heart of the lotus feet of thy guru. How do we think in our heart? So the first understanding of this is desire. And when you really, really want something, it's impossible not to think of it. And when we, um, let's see where I wanted to go with this. Again, I'm just going to repeat that. When you really want it, it's impossible not to think of it. So the ultimate aim here is to really want God. 
But we have to do all of these outer things to learn how to refine our heart's feelings and learn how to refine our heart's, our, our mind. The point I wanted to say is reason follows feeling. That actually feeling is a stronger force here. It seems like mind might be a stronger force and mind is a strong force. Mind is superior to energy. Energy is superior to matter. But consciousness is superior to all of those three. Consciousness is superior to mind. And the closest thing to consciousness is feeling. And so we need to learn how to refine our heart's feelings. Right now, most of us, our heart's feelings are a jumble box. with zillions, okay, millions, <laughs> of desires in there. And they're all just coming in, you know, when they want. They're not listening to us. And we need to learn how to refine these feelings, how to really crack the whip on our own heart. And this comes with wisdom and understanding and discipline. And even discipline outwardly, to discipline ourselves in diet or sleep or speech, all of these outward things. But we then need to go within with wisdom and just ask, at the end of the day, do I really want any of these things? What's my number one heart's desire at the end of the day? And of course, that has to be God. And then you can separate your wants from your needs. And you'll find that your needs actually are very few. Remember Swami Pranabhananda, somewhere near the end of his life, that he just had a few seeds of spinach and carrots. Very healthy, by the way. He said, I'm going up to found a little ashram. These seeds are all I need, a few disciples. I'll teach them meditation. Here's our food. Thoughts, okay, I'm done. What's really needed? Okay. Now our lives are a little more complicated than that, fine. But still, there's a lot of things in here in the heart that they're, they're not needs. They're simply wants. We can just cast them out and we can burn them. Um, and once we get a clear heart's feeling, then the mind, it automatically becomes purified. And again, this is yoga and learning how to, with a strong flow of energy, learn how to purify ourselves on a feeling level. People don't understand that if you do a lot of Mahamudra, it's like, whoa, hot. And no, that's like huffing and puffing and stretching. What does that have to do with purifying my heart? But it has to do with creating a strong flow of energy that will gather all of these nonsense desires that we have and in a focused manner, burn them at the spiritual eye. And this is really the, the need for all of us to learn how to, how to pay attention on subtle, subtle ways and how to listen. And finally, the last um, words to that chant are, um, Guru, image of Brahma, deliver us from delusion. Honestly, achieving these levels of purity that I'm talking about, that it's bigger than us. It's a big job. But if we allow the Guru to come into our heart and we allow his power, his concentration, his wisdom to come in and purify us, then we can achieve these levels of concentration that um, right now might seem beyond us. So to wrap up here, don't strain to achieve concentration. I hope that I've given you understanding of how important concentration is, that with it you can develop a magnetism to achieve absolutely anything that you want outwardly, and then finally you can achieve inwardly um, the ability to become one with God. And what else is there than to become one with God? And don't think that you're going to try, 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 and it's going to be so hard, so hard, and then one day God will come. He does give a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. It doesn't come all one time. But he keeps giving enough, I promise you. The path becomes very, very enjoyable if we'll just put a little energy into it. Okay, so now please start typing in your comments there in the chat. The beautiful thing about this little room is you can write it in there privately. And so if I see the word private there, I won't reveal your name. And uh, you can ask absolutely anything. And I'm simply here to help you in the way that Swamiji has guided me. So the first question up there, I talked about the need to switch from outer work to switching in. And, uh, but is switching in, in outwards, 
is that switching outward thing good? Okay, so absolutely the switching outward thing is good. That we have to be, look, there's no way that you're going to be able to achieve God realization if you can't set your mind to some outward task and focus on it. Even when then when you start getting phone calls and it seems there's this more important thing and that more important thing. That you have to be able to do whatever you want in this world and do it well before you'll be able to go inward. What you're trying to do with this concentration is marshal your inner forces. And this is bigger than any outward war on this planet that you could ever imagine. If you were the prime minister of this country and you had to marshal all of the forces of India to go to war with some other country, that's nothing compared to the battle of Kurukshetra that's going on within you. And if you only knew the generals that live at each chakra, at the center of them and how powerful they are, and if you could get those, you can control the entire universe. The entire universe is yours to control, but you have to know how to do it. And you become very powerful as a yogi, but we have to learn these lessons outwardly. Um, I know that it seems like we go too far out, and there is a point where you go too far out, and you're just scattered, you're burned, and you can't do anything outwardly anymore, and you can't uh, meditate. In the end, it's balance. Balance is the word. Um, but certainly we're going to have to learn how to put a strong flow of energy out. You know, I had a meeting with Shurjo Narayani yesterday. They're putting on a fest here in about a month. And they don't like to call it a fest. Fine. It's a, um, not even a spiritual fair. They're calling it an online retreat. Not getting into all of that. But they're such magnetic people that when I watched their little presentation, I said, I want to join this. Whatever people that are helping me, I want to have them channel in this direction because it's a great thing. It's because they have magnetism. It's because they have concentration and that they're in tune with Swamiji. Anyway, the next question there was, how about multitasking? Multitasking, it's a bad thing, um, but we have to be realistic in this world. Um, uh, here, let me say realistic. That, and let me explain, actually, this is a helpful thing. So let's say that Amit Mohan writes me an email, and now I'm reading it, I'm focused on it, I'm concentrating on it, and that now I have some task that I need to do in order to reply back to Amit Mohan. Um, but let's say that task, I can't do it right away, that I have to call Shurjo in order to do this. So I call Shurjo. Shurjo doesn't answer. Well, of course, I have to then put that email on the back burner until Shurjo answers again. But it's about dismissing it from my mind and not kind of having it hang there in my mind or maybe even on the screen of my laptop. It's about dismissing that, going on to the next email with concentration. Um, but if I'm trying to write three emails in a row, and I've seen people that they open tabs on their computer and they have 50 different tabs open, it makes it very hard to concentrate. You can have a few tabs open, fine. Um, but there's clutter in there, even on your screen and in your mind. People who live in a room that is very cluttered, it's a reflection of an outer cluttered mind. And it's fine to have things, we use these things, but each of those things should have a home that it goes back to when you're done using it so that the outer environment is clean and clear. Um, so multitasking overall is bad, but we live in a world where uh, we have to do it to some extent, but pay attention to how you do it. The next question, and please write, thank you, is you mentioned using concentration to accomplish anything. How should we keep the ego disassociated through this? First is to learn to have a healthy, good ego. To do these little tasks, you have to feel that I can do this. It's just part of growing up. And to think, oh, no, no, I don't want to feel that I can do it. That uh, No ego, no ego. Ego's bad. Ego's not so bad. Um, and ego is actually the thing that uh, will marshal your inner forces and learn how to guide your inner forces towards the right thing. Ego living here has to learn to get all of these five Pandavas in line before they can offer themselves to Krishna. Um, but now, once you start doing bigger and bigger things, and you want to raise huge amounts of money, uh, or I don't know, that you have, I don't know, a thousand people working under you, or whatever it is, and then you're faced, let's take a very practical example I gave the other day in a satsang. Let's say you're a politician, a world leader somewhere, not world leader, there are no world leaders, but uh, a leader of some country, and now you're faced with this decision. Do I go lockdown 
and ruin more the economy, which is might end up people starving to death? Or do I release the lockdown, more people get the virus? When you get to these big levels, there are no right answers. People are dying no matter which way you go. Now is the time you have to say, I cannot make this decision with my ego. Then no matter what I do, it's gonna go wrong. Now is the time to say, God, God, you've put me in this position, the responsibility for crores of people's uh, safety and well-being. What's the right decision? And I know that we're going to have tough times no matter which way I go, but God, what do you want? So first we build a healthy ego. Then once we get to a state where we're doing big, big things, then we're asking God. Of course we want to be asking God even in the little things because we are devotees. But I'm just telling you here of the normal flow of human evolution over many incarnations. Um, so, of course, try to keep the ego at bay. But before you can do little things, you're not going to keep the ego at bay. And these biggest things, even way bigger than leading a nation, is leading your own self. And leading your own inner energies and your own thoughts and becoming in control of them. That's way bigger than being the prime minister of a country. Think about that. The next uh, question here, how to go deep in Hong Sa with so many techniques. To do Hong Sa takes backstage. Yeah, 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 yeah. That can so easily happen that Hong Sa can take backstage because we have Kriya, we have Mahamudra, we have energization, we have Om technique. Perhaps you like Navi Kriya. It's good for you. Don't let it take backstage. As you really grow and go in this, that you'll find, you know, there's this quote, I hope you all know it. Uh, it's basically, uh, give me the most restless young man, let him practice Kriya um, in the way that I say for two hours, and I guarantee that within five years I'll make a saint out of it. It won't be easy, uh, but it'll be worth it. When I first read that, I thought, I'm a restless young man, sign me up. I can do two hours of Kriya every day. If you do two hours of Kriya every day, you need to balance that. I would say with two hours of Hong Sa every day. The master said, you know, I'll give me any restless young man, let him practice Kriya for two hours every day. I can say, I just want to be a master in this incarnation, practice two hours of Hong Sa. I don't think these two are uh, mutually exclusive. But if you're doing that much Kriya every day, you're definitely, in my opinion, going to need to balance it with just practicing Hong Sa. You're doing that amount of Hong Sa every day, you're going to get to a point where you're stuck and the energy needs to flow. It's like, how can I go deeper with this? Do you want Kriya? Um, so don't, don't. Make sure that all of your techniques are balanced. And if you only have, you know, two hours per day for sadhana, make sure you do the right amount of Kriya that's right for you, but make sure you do enough Hong Sa there also. That balanced way is the way that's going to take you all the way to the end. That relaxation and concentration, it even is applying to the long distance journey that our sadhana is, and that we need to make sure that we balance it and that we do it in a relaxed way. So please put that back into your schedule and make time for it, find time for it, that this is the thing that's going to allow you to accomplish more in this world because you become more efficient. Concentration allows us to become more efficient human beings. Okay, here's a private one, so I won't say any name here. When we're deeply involved in a project, well, actually, I don't think it went so private because it went to all the panelists, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, when we're stuck up, Okay, so when we're deeply involved in a project and we're stuck, I'm stuck up, we can be, absolutely you can get solutions to it. In meditation, we get these thoughts. Yeah, yeah, good question. How do we know? So let's say you have some deep project, you decide I'm going to meditate. First of all, meditate, and that means do Hong Sa, do your Kriya, do all the other techniques. Sit in the silence afterwards. And even in that silent time, say, This is my silent time for God. I'm only focusing on peace. I'm not letting any of these other thoughts enter. But then after that, you can take the time to say, okay, God, I've given everything I can to commune with you, to be one with you. Now I need a solution to this project. Please tell me what it is. And this is, this is the difference between a master and a decent yogi. Uh, that a master will really know that this is coming from God and it's not my own mind working. 
And that again becomes a subtle, subtle feeling. And this is why we have the outer world. We think, okay, God really wanted me to do this. And we go out there and we try it and it completely collapses and crashes. And we realize uh, that was my own mind and it wasn't God. And sometimes the opposite happens and you feel this flow of grace and it just becomes effortless and you realize you're in tune with God's will. Um, so it simply is a matter of experience to know whether it's God's will or whether it's um, your own making. You know, there's a story when Master got Mount Washington and um, he had to raise the money in three months and someone said, no, no, you it's going to take you 20 years to raise that amount of money. And Master said, 20 years for those who think 20 years, uh, 20 months for those who think 20 months, and three months for those who think three months, I'm going to raise this in three months. And he did raise it in three months. By the way, I meditate on that. Master, he, by the time he, he went to America when he was 27, by the time he was 33, he had Mount Washington, uh, the money raised for it. it Probably took him time to pay off some loans that he brought together, but in five years. And now we've been here in India for God knows how many years. We're doing good. We own a few properties, but Master was just like, oh, five years, done. Concentration, focused. Here's the important part of that whole story that I, I told it for this reason. Dharma Das Ji, he asked Swamiji, how far can you extend that? Three months for those who think three months. Can you say three weeks for those who three three weeks? You know, three minutes and Master could have just gone home and somebody would have called him and said, here's all the money you need. And Swamiji said, no, that it has to be in tune with God's will. And that was a big wake up call for me because I, the power of the mind, I'm just going to manifest all these things that I want. Oh no. And especially as you get to bigger and bigger things, it has to be in tune with God's will. So you're, this is, this was again, part of the question that you asked. Next question. When you have two choices, should you put energy to both? How to decide to put concentration behind which choice? Good. So, um, you know, sometimes, and I watch Swamiji do this too, just put a little bit of energy into this one. You're not sure which one you're really going to go with and then really give it your all. And put a little energy, put a little energy, put a little energy. But at some point, you have to make a decision and then go for it. And it's even better to fail with that one that you choose because you realize rather than just spend five more weeks going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Don't be afraid. I've made some big blunders like that $200,000 one I told you about. But I learned from it and I've become a more successful person through learning from that. Um, so there's, there's your answer to that. Um, maybe this is the last thing here. Sometimes it takes time for things to go wrong. Then what do you do? You know what, honestly, we are playing with things here that are speaking of multiple incarnations. And sometimes something can look like it's going right for the entire incarnation. And we don't know. It's actually gonna blow up and go wrong next incarnation. Um, and so it is difficult to know God's will. Um, but um, here's the thing, is to understand that God's will ultimately is for our good in everything. And so if we can understand, even when something goes really, really wrong, to say now, ultimately, how is this for my own good? And how did God do this so that it could be good? So let's end on that thought that everything is happening for good. And we'll understand even the bad by meditating and asking God, how was this for my own good? What was I trying, what was I supposed to learn from this? And how can I be more in tune with you um, for the next time? So that with that in tuneness, if I can make up a word, that I can have greater concentration, greater willpower, God, to do your will. So I'm going to end on that note. And yes, hand it back to Janet. Thank you, Jamalji. That was really insightful. And for, you know, some of us who have been Kriya Bans and kind of, you know, think, oh, we have to finish our Shriya. Somewhere you lose the basic of, you know, sitting on for Hans saw and the basic, the first lessons that we learned when we came on the path. So it was kind of revisiting that and all these things that you just shared and the questions the way the ones you answered have 
I'm sure got all of us thinking about how to, you know, take this more deeply into these uh, teachings and your uh, uh, your insights more deeply into our everyday life. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been a great joy to be with everyone.